Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Justin the Food Entrepreneur Show. I'm Justin Bizarro. I'm your host. That's B I W Z A W R O. For anyone who's out there, you can find us on Spotify or wherever else you grow yourself through podcasts. You can also find us on Instagram at Justin the Food Entrepreneurs or at Justin Bizarro. Again, that's B I W Z A W R O. So, with that being said, a very special episode 333. Everyone knows 33 is my lucky number. So, that's pretty cool. Also, I have a very special guest with us from Nashville, Tennessee. She's a singer, songwriter, and chef. Her name is Gina Cecilia, and she owns and operates Gina's Italian Cuisine. How are you doing today, Gina? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm I'm, I'm doing good. Now that we got this thing started, I had some hiccups yeah. there as we, we experienced. The audience, thankfully, doesn't have to experience that stuff. Uh, it's not live. So that's pretty good. Yeah. Pretty cool. But it happens. So, <laughs> so Gina, tell me about your story. Where'd you grow up? Where'd you come from? Mm-hmm. And and sort of how'd you end up in Nashville as both a singer songwriter and chef or entrepreneur, for lack of a better term? Yeah. Well, I grew up near Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, um, a little town called Newtown, just about twenty minutes outside the city, and uh, that's where I was born and raised, and lived until I moved to Nashville. And I was always exposed to music from a young age, always knew that I wanted to be a singer, started singing and writing songs at a very early age and, and performing. And, um, and um, to this date, I have recorded and released 10 studio albums, working on an 11th currently. Um, I've toured internationally. Uh, I've been in the music business for a couple decades now. And I actually had an album release scheduled during the pandemic, May 2020. Terrible timing. I went through with the album release, but all the tour dates were kind of can- were canceled and music was sort of put on pause a little bit. So during the pandemic, I nurtured my second love, which is Italian cooking. Um, I grew up in, in an Italian family. My dad was born and raised in Southern Italy. So I guess that makes me second generation. And uh, it's always been a, a big part of my life. And it's something that I have uh, have just become increasingly passionate about the older I get. So I, I sort of nurtured my love of Italian cooking during the pandemic and started to merge the that the food with with my music. So for that album release during the pandemic, I would offer recipe cards to people who pre-ordered my album. I did some live streaming cooking shows from my my house in East Nashville during lockdown and kind of uh, premiered some of my new music. So I started to merge the two things and it just grew and grew. And then in March 2021, I decided to start uh, doing some Italian entree deliveries in Nashville to people that I knew in the neighborhood or um, I would take orders online. And then eventually I started doing farmer's markets and some wholesale selling my tomato sauce in stores. Um, About a year later, I fell into catering and special events and pop ups and dining experiences and Um, and now here I am, I'm still doing it. And I'm in my, my, I'm in my third year now and, uh, still, still making music and still, um, growing my food business in Nashville. I love this. Um, and what a place to happen. (laughs) This number one, I get all the musicians there, all the stuff there. I've spent a lot of time there, obviously, um, the Mm -hmm. competition, the ability to hone in on your skills from, a singer songwriter musician standpoint I think is huge and surrounded by that atmosphere but also to your second passion uh, Nashville is quite the booming food town right now Um, and it's crazy how many businesses are popping up number one the tourism industry there and the amount of hotels and stuff being built and trying to find space it's almost like Manhattan they're just going up okay so you have lots of population there you have lots of people moving there uh, or moving there for work, but also have a lot of people visiting there. Um, I think something like 20 bit million people or something this year is something mm-hmm. ridiculous. I The prediction is, or 21 million, I think, was the number I saw the other day, which mm-hmm. is a lot of people to come into a town uh, the size of Nashville, which is usually about 1.2 million people when there's no one around. So um, – Talk to me about, like, how do you develop recipes? How did you come up with concepts? Like, okay, you're like, all right, I'm going to do Italian cuisine. I'm going to stick to my family. You know, southern Italy, I get it. Uh, Southern-ish Italy here, like, from Naples. And our family is anyway, not me directly. But 
talk to me a little bit about how you you get this idea, you start to do this concept. How do you develop recipes? Yeah. How do you come up with concepts? Yeah. How do you like where do you even begin? Because I it, it's one thing to have an idea; it's another thing to put it into action. Yeah, yeah. Well, I I'm always inspired, and 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 one of the things I love about this food business is that it is creative. It has a lot of opportunities to be creative if you if you let it <laughs> if you let it. Um, you know, have a creative aspect to it. Um, so when I sell my food at farmer's markets, I do a rotating menu. I never repeat a dish from week to week. I come up with new new dishes for each farmer's market. And sometimes they'll be connected to a theme or a holiday or, you know, in June I did rainbow pasta for Pride Month. Um, you know, things like that. I try to keep it fun and creative and I try to... Um, uh, kind of keep my marketing creative online on, especially I do a lot of it on Facebook. Um, so I'm just inspired by um, just coming up with different, I don't know, amalgamations of, of food that I like and, and ingredients that I like. And I love making meat based dishes and sauces. And um, I am definitely inspired by Italian American food as well as traditional Italian food from Southern Italy and Northern Italy throughout Italy. So I'm, I like to, um, you know, just constantly come up with new creations. And I, I don't write my recipes down. Most of it is just by memory or it's kind of intuitive. Uh, although I would like to uh, finish a cookbook that I had started writing <laughs> at some point. But I just, I'm just kind of, it, I kind of approach it the same way as my music. I'm just, um, I create when I'm inspired. So that's basically how I approach it. I like this a lot. So let's talk about what are your favorite things. Like, give We talked a little bit about the pasta. I think that's brilliant. Okay, I think that's really cool. Mm -hmm. Just like because Italians are so much into rainbow cake and rainbow cookies anyway, why not have rainbow yeah. pasta? So yes. there's that. And I, I partnered with a local organization for that one called Launchpad. And I donate 15% of each order at the end of the market day to that organization. So it's sort of a fundraising thing as well as kind of a, a fun, creative pasta dish. I love it. So what are, I mean, what's your favorite, let's let, before we get into like what you do the, the, for the, the company or building this business, like generally like growing up or before you started the food company, what was your favorite cuisine? Like where was your favorite things to eat? If it's, it's in the Italian threshold, what, what, what was that? You know, sort of what are the things that you're attracted to beforehand um, or the things you were attracted to cooking beforehand before starting a business? Well, always Italian food. I've always loved. I mean, I love all food. Don't get me wrong, but I've always loved Italian food and I love I've always loved making pasta. And one of the things that I love mostly uh, specifically, I guess, about a southern Italian cooking is that it's very simple. It's each dish is made with very simple ingredients, a few ingredients but very flavorful elements. And that's what I love about Southern Italian cooking. I was never really attracted to, I guess, like like the upscale dining kind of thing or um, dishes that might seem overly fancy or pretentious or dainty. I love the home style, family style, kind of rustic, um, traditional Italian dishes, like very hearty, kind of like Italian comfort food. That's what I love to make. And I love I love making colorful food. That's something that I'm always paying attention to is the color detail of my food and my dishes and making sure I have balanced color and and that um, I pay attention to detail in terms of flavor and and that it's aesthetically pleasing as well. I love this because I agree with you. I think the coloration on the plate is hugely important. I think uh, in Italian food, we have a lot of red and a lot of white. Um, mm -hmm. so to find coloration is good, especially with, with our cuisine. Um, so what you've been doing and bringing in other fruits and vegetables and, and meats and stuff like that, I think help give it that when you said, um, about meat dishes and you love making sauces with meat, um, talk about that a little bit more. What do you mean by that? What do you mean by sauces with meat and, and what kind of sauces are you talking about? Well, I love making like a ragu. I love making a sausage ragu. And again, they're very simple sauces. They don't contain, you know, a whole list of ingredients, um, which is, but they taste 
they taste incredible, which is what I love about them. So I, I'll, I like to make a sausage ragu with caramelized onions and some tomato or maybe like a dash of cream in it. I love making short rib ragu. I love making like bolognese. bolognese. Um, I love doing that. I love cooking a big pot of tomato sauce with sausage and short ribs and meatballs in it and getting the flavor from the meat into the tomato sauce. I think that's the best. Um, I just love um, meat-based sauces. It's one of my favorite things to make. And I kind of love, I'm, one of the things I'm passionate about is making the sauces and, and kind of developing the flavors and building them, starting with like um, rendering the pancetta and with garlic and then olive oil and and then browning mushrooms and then deglazing the pan with some wine. And I love building meat sauces that, in that way. I love doing it. I love this. So let's talk about like when you go to an event or you you do one of your pop-ups or you go to the farmer's mm -hmm. market, like give me an example of the exact menu that you would use at maybe your most recent event. Uh, if it was mm -hmm. the rainbow pasta, like how, if someone goes there, are they just getting pasta? Like how do you prepare? What, what are the number of items? Like what mm -hmm. are people were looking for when they come see you? Yeah. So if I'm setting up at a farmer's market, what I'm doing is I set up my tent, I have my booth and it's basically like I'm packaging my catering because I can't sell hot food at the farmer's markets because it's not connected to a commercial kitchen. So basically what I do is I package all of my food that's made the day before or that morning into to-go containers and I bring it all to the farmer's market in a cooler and it's ready for people to purchase and take home and eat and microwave and heat up. So that's what I do at the farmer's markets and I also do desserts. And I'll, sometimes I'll do some, some shelf stable items like Italian seasonings or even uh, little Italian treats or snacks that are shelf stable and I'll sell those. But for the most part, it's Italian entrees, sauces and desserts that are pre-made, ready-made and, and packaged in to-go containers ready to take home and eat. In each market, it's a different menu. I don't want to repeat myself because I like to keep people coming back. If I have, if I offer the same meal each week, it's, it's monotonous for people and, and I, I like to offer something different that people might want to try to keep them as, as, as customers every week. So for example, last week I did my rainbow pasta of the week dish for pride month, which was a pasta with zucchini and pecorino with, with rainbow noodles. And then I had jumbo stuffed shells with a meat, a beef ragu. I had um, pasta with sausage, peppers and onions. That's another dish that I love to make sausage, peppers and onions. Um, I had, what else did I make? Um, I had my rainbow, Italian rainbow cake. I had some cannoli. Um, one thing that I've been doing recently that I've added to my, my, uh, my menu and my, my husband's been helping me make them. Um, they are Southern Italian, uh, baked figs. So basically we get dried figs and we stuff them with walnuts uh, dip them in a, a, a secret ingredient, which I cannot reveal, and we slow bake them. And they caramelize, and they're they're delicious. And it's kind of a, a traditional Southern Italian snack or dessert or breakfast, <laughs> whatever you want to make it. And I, I think they're also, I've, I've heard maybe they're popular also throughout the Mediterranean, maybe in, in Greece also. In the yeah, absolutely. Of but but um, I've, I've been adding them and I, I sell them in a bakery box and and I, I do an Italian seasoning blend. I um, so I'm just I'm constantly coming up with new items to sell. But usually each m menu will always include some kind of meat sauce. Um, I did bracciole a couple weeks ago. That was sort of my hot item of the week. And that sold out. I did bracciole that I slow cooked for 10 hours and tomato sauce. And I served it with cappellini. Um, so I'm, I'm just, you know, always, always inspired to do new things. I also did eggplant parm last Friday. Um, so I usually have between five and seven dishes that I'm selling per week. So I, I'm going to get to, to this, like you're an artist, like singing at Saul Ryan was obviously your first passion cause you chose that first. Okay. Mm -hmm. But you're now in food also, like how do you balance trying to, pursue your first dream and also now this what I would call your second dream yeah well that's it has been a balance and you know I, I definitely suffered from a bit of an identity crisis when I in the in the beginning of the, the food business adventure because it sort of felt like I was abandoning music in a way which I've 
have devoted my life to for two decades or in long, longer than two decades. So it, it was sort of strange in the beginning to be focusing so much on something else other than music after such a long time. But it's really um, something that I'm proud of now. And I, I think, you know, the music business gets increasingly harder with each passing year. <laughs> and it's, and I, it, it wasn't easy for a lot of musicians to bounce back after the pandemic and start touring again. And it, it's, it's, it's become more expensive and it's, it's just always becoming more difficult, especially the older you get to tour like that. And it's not always the best quality of life. And it doesn't mean um, that you don't love music anymore, that you don't want to make music anymore. There's, there's always ways to do that. But to have this other method of making a living now is, has kind of brought me a better quality of life. And um, it's been so gratifying. And it's also given me opportunities sometimes to, to merge the food with my music. So I've done events in Nashville where I perform and I cook for the crowd. So I feel like there's something unique that I can offer that's authentic and that's creative and that I'm passionate about. So it's, it's definitely opened other doors for me. And, and there have, there are people who have discovered my music through my food and vice versa. So it's been a positive thing. It's been a positive thing for me. I, I like that you anch- you anchored something. I'm going to anchor it for the audience because we actually just talked about this on my leadership, uh, the Centurion Leadership Battalion show with Justin Mazzaro, the one of the other shows we do. Uh, again, mm-hmm. guys, you can find that on Spotify or wherever else you grow yourself through podcasts. But you mentioned the identity crisis, which I think is, is very interesting. And I wasn't thinking that that's what you're going to say, but you hit the nail on the head in that you envision yourself as a singer-songwriter. Now you're having to envision yourself as a food entrepreneur. And so that's a big step, right? That's a big change in your life. I mean, um, were you embarrassed? Did you did you think food was lower than, than your standard? I'm just curious because I know what it's like to all of a sudden be like, who am I and why am I doing this? And are people going to see me in this way the same way as they see me in something else? Yeah, you know, there's definitely a little bit of that. Like, you know, So the first summer that I was doing farmer's markets, it was summer 2021. It was kind of around the time that a lot of artists started to uh, go head back out on tour. And, um, and so it's, while th- normally that's what I would have been doing as well, I was <laughs> like loading in at farmer's markets and setting up my little booth in, in 95 degree weather, selling my little pasta dishes. And I kind of felt like, who am I and how did I get here? And um, I never would have imagined that I'd be doing this, but um, I not only got used to it and stopped feeling that kind of like, I don't know if you would call it like shame or just feeling like I had been maybe defeated in a way. <laughs> I don't know. I, I almost an I, imposter it, in some ways. Yeah. And yes, exactly. I, I stopped feeling that way and, and really came to embrace it and, and love it and, and prefer it. And especially uh, as, you know, the next the couple next couple years went by and I saw how difficult and I would heard, heard stories of how difficult it was for a lot of artists to return to the touring world after uh, post-COVID. Um, touring got so expensive, gas prices, hotel prices, um, it, it, things still haven't quite recovered and, and um, a lot of musicians who started around the same time as me and had a similar career path have kind of gotten burned out. Um, and, and knowing that I can still record and still perform whenever I want without the pressure of um, having to keep a full tour schedule of kind of just like venues that I don't necessarily want to play, um, being out on the road for weeks at a time and, sometimes losing money and just being exhausted and burnt out and, and just kind of having a poor quality of life. I would never go back to that. And I, I would never give up my, my food business for that. Not in a million years. I, I, I love how my life is now and I love the balance of my food and music and I still perform. I'm st- still in the studio right now making my next album and I have a show tomorrow night. And um, and I'm excited about it. I try to do a gig once or twice a month, and I have a great community of musicians in town here in Nashville. So I'm still very much active musically, but the pressure is off in a lot of ways. And and I have this new endeavor and this new career that I've been building myself for the future. 
because you know for what, what is the music business going to look like in in 20 years and 30 years <laughs> you know um i i i know that it, and even in my in some of my lowest moments when i'm frustrated and and um feeling tired from from schlepping food around i know that i am building something for myself to to have and to to um to um you know, benefit me in the future when music might not be a possibility anymore. So. Yeah, and I agree. I think humans are always going to need food. And even if robots or whatever come along or we can magically make it appear, humans are still better, going to be better at creating stuff on the fly, doing recipes, stuff like that. I get it. Robots and AI might catch up and stuff like that. But it's still not. Food is still going to be food. It's still going to be food. And there's so much diversity yeah. and talent yeah. and creativity in it. I, it really does reside in the human brain for the most part. Um, I don't yeah. think it's something and that's as easy as chat CBT or whatever those are that, that can create music now. Or I just saw today that one is host a whole DJ show. I know I've seen it like literally take my voice and like it'll host a whole podcast like it's me and almost act oh, exactly wow. like That's me good. and and pretend it's me with a guest on a podcast. And so oh, I'm that like, you know, how 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 long lived is the career I'm choosing right now? And again, that's why I still stay in food because I believe humans need to eat forever. There's always a need for for food and bringing family together and human growth. Those two fields, I think food, human growth. Yeah you know, regenerating our planet, it's not going to happen by robots, it's going to happen by humans and human choices. So, um, yeah. And, and it not only has taken the pressure off of, of making a living from music, it has now given me the, the ability to financially support my own music career. So I was able to self fund an album two years ago out of the profits I made during the first year of my food business. So, um, so that's a huge plus. So I, I can, if I have to pay my band members out of pocket, I have the money to do that now because of my food business. So it, it's, it's just given me the ability to, to support myself and make a living and really support my own music. So, um, cause it's, music is not always profitable. Um, I don't care what anyone says. <laughs> it's, yeah. it, it is not, it is it's not easy to make money in the music business. And um, so I'm, I'm very thankful for the situation that I've, I've created for myself. And I like this a lot because I think um, it's the entrepreneurial ingenuity of life helps us achieve our dreams through and being an entrepreneur in the way that you are and using your ingenuity um, in the food has given you the freedom that you ultimately wanted. You may have to work two jobs, but you love them both, so maybe it's not work. But what's weird is it's probably more freeing and less stressful than it was when you were just working one, you know, so. Yeah, and, I, and it's, you know, even though, I guess you would consider it two jobs, it's two careers, and I'm still making my own schedule. I'm only working for myself. I'm not, I'm not going into an office every day. I'm not reporting to a job. I am my own boss. Um, I don't have to answer to anyone but myself and I can work when I want to work and I can take off when I want to take off. So that, that is, that is the goal. <laughs> That's the goal, I guess, with being an entrepreneur, right. For any, for anyone is to have that freedom, that, that independence. And that's something that's very important to me. And it's something that has always driven me to want to be an entrepreneur. Yeah, I Having agree. that freedom and that flexibility. Yeah. I think, uh, musicians are similar to entrepreneurs in a lot of way and it's probably why there's a lot of crossover there particularly in nashville there's a lot of restaurateurs and stuff that have started off in nashville as musicians and then moved their way by jobs or having to keep a roof over their head into food and then became restaurateurs or in the food business mm -hmm. i find there a lot and the reason I think that is also is because the creativity is the same. The the hustle is the same in a lot of ways. However, in food, um, everyone has to eat all the time. And most of the time, everyone's going to like most of the food or at least try some of the food. It's very rare anymore that people don't have a diverse palate. There are people, but it's very rare. And so on uh, contrary to music where it's like taste and, and there's a lot of competition out there and not everyone goes to a concert every day or buys music every day, food is a little bit different in that way. Food, people buy it every day, eat every day, they go out every day, they do all that stuff. So I feel like on one hand, the entrepreneurial mindset's very si similar. The creativity, the, the free spirit, I would say is very similar. 
However, if you look at it on paper, um, the food business still has the ability to profit. And if you have a good concept and a good business, you have the ability to go on forever. Where in music, I feel like even as a great musician and someone who could release 20 great albums there's still the ebbs and flows of human taste and while that exists in food it's not quite the same you know yes and the reality is and 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 i guess two things back to what you said about musicians are like entrepreneurs musicians are essentially entrepreneurs they're essentially business owners um they are business owners who offer their music to the world that's something that i i picked up on recently um it's you know it's something that a lot of musicians don't really um, they, they don't really take c- control in that way, or maybe they don't see themselves as entrepreneurs. But I recently did this program, this local program in Nashville called Periscope, and it's um, for uh, artist entrepreneur training. And it's kind of just to give you a perspective as a creative business owner and and just to take control of your business. But one thing that they said on the first day is um, act like, if you're an artist, act like an, an entrepreneur not like an artist, but what what did they say? Act like an entrepreneur who offers your art to the world, not as an artist. So, um, so that's something that kind of resonated with me to, um, see myself as an entrepreneur who offers my art to the world, whether it's music or food. Um, and I think that's also important for musicians to understand. Um, but, um, I, but yes, I think there, there are a lot of similar aspects to it in terms of creativity and, and the flexibility and, but the reality is that, like you said, there's you can get you can get burnt out in either career. But I think there's more longevity in the food business. And at the end of the day, people value food more than, than not that they don't value music, but they're willing to spend money on food. <laughs> people aren't as willing to spend money on music, especially these days. And that's. I don't know if that's going to be changing anytime soon. So it's, it's, it's in a way it's valued a little bit more. So that's, that helps. Well, and I agree with you. And one of the things I will say, um, just from an outsider and looking in and spending so much time in Nashville, um, and the music there and some time in the music scene up in New York, as well as just being a music lover in general. Um, Mm -hmm. I will say this, uh, particularly in Nashville, um, there could be the greatest artist singer ever, he or she, doesn't matter, and they could be on Broadway, okay, the main strip. But the problem is if they can't handle themselves like a business person, they can't handle themselves in a professional way, they're not going to do anyone any good because even when you guys go out on the road or you guys do stuff, your independent business is functioning in a whole environment or industry, no different than a business that goes to you know, uh, a food truck rally. Okay, you're one business amongst others and a whole greater concept. And I think that that's part of it and part of where a lot of musicians go wrong, I would say, is that there's this, you can have your image and you can have your wild and and whatever and rock and roll and country music and whatever, but at the end of the day, you're still a business person because you are the business. You know, it's like Jay-Z's line, I'm a businessman and I'm a businessman. You know, I'm the business and I'm a businessman. You know, so I think that there's a lot of that that goes on. And I would say the same in the food industry also to a point. A lot of people open businesses or start businesses but don't realize the the amount of professionalism uh, that needs to take place in business that needs to, like, take place along with entrepreneurism. You know, we often, oh, I just want to be the creative. Well, nope. There's this whole refined piece of, like, accounting and marketing and answering emails and communicating on a scale and and being accountable you know so if you're yeah, budgeting and yeah and log- the logistics behind it yes indeed yeah and if you're on you know tour and you're touring five six seven nights a week and you're trying to manage your life but you're also a rock and roll living like a rock and roll star like for worst like the stereotypical one not the actual one that's a business person but the stereotypical figment one that that has existed in the past you it's not sustainable that's why these bands that's why these groups they don't last because if you don't run the business it's ultimately will will take down the music also and, and my and from what i've seen and from what i've read and and my experience uh in nashville as well is that if you don't catch up on the business side as a uh, human, you often lose what you have. Um, and I would say that as an entrepreneur, 
if you lose your creativity and you lose your wild streak on the opposite side uh, by becoming too business-like, you're going to lose your business as well because you're not going to be creative or what brought you to be an entrepreneur in the first place. So exactly. So, yeah. you know, it's two edges on that, that sword um, and two sides for sure. So growing up, right. uh, Gina, growing up, who was your inspiration in life? Who motivated you? Who inspired you, even if it's through music? Like, yeah. where did all of that come from, this this big drive that you have? I mean, you're running two businesses now, um, basically. And so where does this big drive come from? Who inspired you growing up? Oh, well, I, I, I suppose my family inspired me and, uh, you know, there was a lot of, of wonderful culture in my family growing up, whether it was music, food, traveling, um, and being exposed to all those different things. Uh, my dad is an entrepreneur, um, and he's always had that mindset. He's the, the entrepreneurial mindset. Um, and he, he came to America from Italy and, and as a teenager in the sixties and he, and he built a business, a very successful business. And um, so that always inspired me. And I, I think I inherited that, uh, those entrepreneurial tendencies from my dad. And I, it, I, I think that no matter what I'm doing, though, I'm always kind of like have a tendency to become obsessed with whatever it is I want to do, whether that was music or food. Um, once I have my mindset on something, it's, it just becomes an obsession and a compulsion for that's the, the best way to describe it. And I've always been that way. So I was that way with music growing up, with listening to music and with singing 24-7, with writing songs 24-7. Um, when it came time to tour, I spent all my free time booking tour dates and writing songs and and building my social media, even in the early days of social media, in the MySpace days. I was always just kind of one of those around-the-clock people that was constantly thinking about the thing that I wanted to do and the thing that I loved. And that's, that's how I am. It's when there's something I want to do. It's the first thing I think about when I wake up and it's the last thing I think about when I go to sleep. So since I started the food business, it's kind of um, food has sort of taken the place of that obsession that, that used to be about music. But um, I guess it's just my personality. It's, I guess I have an obsessive personality. <laughs> you could say. And, <laughs> You're not I, alone there. Yeah. So, so I guess that's what it is. Yeah. I, I would say it. interestingly, and I've been spending a lot of time with this, a lot of weird as I've, you know, I would say I'm going through something similar where I have this food entrepreneur, but I'm also now in this media space. And then I have this obsession in the media space of being the best that I can and growing this, these podcasts mm -hmm. and these shows and a TV show I'm working on called Foodtopia to the biggest in the world, like the best that's ever been, you know, and mm -hmm. Um, you know, I understand that it's long term, but I also weirdly understand that this obsessive behavior as I've come back to the East Coast from Colorado and spending time in Georgia, spending a lot of time in New York again, in New Jersey and Pennsylvania, uh, and those particular areas where there's a, a higher uh, concentration of Italians and even new immigrants that are coming now. There's a weird thing. We, I think part of the reason we succeed so well as immigrants, and particularly in America, is that obsessive thing that comes along with our culture. I don't know how. I don't know why. I don't know if it's just so the Italians that come to America. I don't think so based on you know the way they care about food over there is, is quite crazy and how seriously they take it and preserve it and, and you know have passed laws to make sure it's almost like the pure Purity rights of alcohol or beer in uh, Germany. And so there's just a weird thing, and it's hard for people to understand. And I will also call it loud love because Italians, we are loud love. Like we're loud, but we're very loving. Okay. And that's mm -hmm. the obsession. Also, we're loud about it. It takes up our whole mind space. It's very loud in our head, but it, we love mm -hmm. what we're doing. And it's not stressful when we're obsessing. And for a lot of people, obsessions can be stressful, but I don't find that. I don't find many family members, many people that I met, restaurateurs, entrepreneurs, people in the food space that have this obsession over pizza or growing their businesses or doing right by their family or being a better second, third generation Italian if they're in a business that doesn't find it that while there is, I'll call quote unquote stress, it's nowhere near the rest of the world because that weird obsession um, almost detaches you from the stressful outcomes. It, it puts you in a space where you're now like, okay, well, 
I, I, I'm trying to succeed in this and I'm obsessed about this now and I'm in the mm-hmm. moment, but you weirdly are doing it because you can see that there's long-term gain there for the rest of yeah. your life. And I don't know why that is, but culturally, for some reason, there's an easy we easily detach and, and, mm-hmm. and the obsession, which is like now, 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 from the stress and to the income. It's not a hundred percent everyone, but there's this weird cultural thing that I've noticed, and, and I don't know again if it's the immigration part or it's the Italian part. I'm thinking it's actually the culture because of being over there a bunch, and I played soccer over there when I was in my youth, and um. It's, it's that type of thing. There's almost like, I would call it a healthy hunger. It's a healthy, insatiable hunger that yeah, just exactly. never goes away. You know, and it's yeah. why Italian men are out there in their bakeries till 90 years old. It's why my dad straight up ran, ran his company until he was 80 some years old. You know, like, it's just like, what are you doing? But it's that obsessive mindset. It's that dedication. It's that wanting to do better. It's that detachment from the immediate outcome. And, and I think also that has to do with immigration is you come over here with nothing. Your whole basis is to provide something better for your family that you never had, right, when you come to America. And so there's a lot of that mentality, too, and that obsession to better your life, which then gets passed down to us also um, as second, you know, third generation, I believe, you know, that the obsession Mm -hmm. to have a better life, the obsession to do better. And then also what I'll say is the obsession to control life by your terms. And I don't mean life is controllable. However, I believe that we have more control over our lives as entrepreneurs or, or singers or creators or whatever than the rest of the world, even though it may not seem that way. But if we Mm -hmm. do, and we stay true to us and we work hard, we do have the freedoms and the Liberty and the independence and the free soul that I was talking about, or the free spirit that many other people don't get. And weirdly, amongst all the stress, and I really, it took me a while before I realized this also, because I weirdly have had a lot of peace of mind a majority of my life because of being around food and following my passions. But when I sort of switched a little bit and, and grew my businesses, and then relationships changed and the world changed, I like went through that identity crisis thing as I went into the podcast and and even though I had the food businesses my obsession became different my my love became different but then what I came to understand is that it's okay to be obsessed about multiple things mm-hmm. it's okay to use the word obsessed and not have it be a quote unquote addiction you know because a lot of people are like oh you work so hard why well I don't know how else to do it and if I take a day off the guilt the shame I feel far outweighs anything, any relaxation I'm going to have. Okay. And I know everyone's like, oh, you need to find time and vacation, whatever. Yes, there's times I can detach and I'm present. You know, I put my phone down. I'm present with my family in the moment. But that does not mean that I take weeks off because I just, it, my mind doesn't work that way because I constantly have that healthy obsession going on about bettering my life, about bettering my businesses, about bettering my career. Um, in a healthy way. I know people can do it's just it in something a that always ways. lives inside you. It's just yeah. something that, sorry. Yeah. It's just something that kind of always lives inside you. And like you said, you're kind of detached from thinking about any possible outcomes. And I, and when I'm feeling that, well, like, well, I'm, I always am, but I, one thing that never enters my mind is what if this doesn't work out? I, I, I never even, I never think about it. I, it's kind of like all hesitation goes out the window and I just, and and everything that I'm passionate about just drives me. And um, I, I I don't think it, I don't consider that something might not work out or that I might fail. Um, I know that it, it, that it could be a possibility, but it doesn't stop me because I don't think that that's the worst thing that can happen. Um, so, um, but you're right. That, that was a very, that was a great, um, I guess, d- description of, of how it feels to be that, passionate and obsessed with with what you're doing and I, I definitely can relate and I believe you're married how did your husband react when you decided you were going to go from like f- uh being a musician into food is it did he I uh, mean how tell me about that dynamic <laughs> well you know what I think um, part of the reason why he married me was because he likes my cooking so that was <laughs> he no he, he Love loved it. it and he still loves it and and he and has the honest unaf- unofficial role of being my quality control expert in Gina's Italian cuisine. So basically he's my taste tester. 
so but he's his, <laughs> his title is quality control expert um, case, <laughs> anything needs to be case tested uh, but he loves it and my my husband's also italian of italian origin and um one side of his family is um from from naples and the other side is sicilian and he grew up italian and uh, originally from buffalo new york and um, he loves italian food luckily so it's right up his alley and uh um he he enjoys he's he enjoys it and he's been along for the journey with me i love it yeah so uh, i mean you you've got a support system you obviously have a good parent who's an entrepreneur who supported you, who, you know, obviously came here, risked everything to build the life that you have and give you the opportunities that you have. You have a supporting mm-hmm. husband. How do you motivate yourself? How do you inspire yourself? Because you, obviously mm-hmm. we can't always rely on other people. Yeah, that's, that's always, I, I would say that's one of the challenges of, of being an entrepreneur and being a, a sole business owner um, is, you know, there, there's no, there's no blueprint. There's no instruction manual um, <laughs> for uh, what to do and when to do it and how to do it. Um, you have to constantly figure out your own way and and create your own your own reality and your own build your own business and 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 just every day come up with something new and 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 figure out the next step forward. So. Um, how do I inspire myself? Well, I think with food, I, <laughs> I think I'm always inspired and I, all I have to do is, is maybe g- go online and, and look at a, a cooking show or look at, look at a picture of food on Instagram and I'm in, uh, instantly inspired and have ideas. And, um, I, sometimes all I have to do is walk around the supermarket or the restaurant supply store and I come up with ideas for dishes. So and it, inspiration is not difficult for me to find. Um, so that, that's not, uh, hard for me at all <laughs> is, is um, finding inspiration, but it is it is definitely work. I mean, day after day, year after year, creating your own your own reality in that way. There is no blueprint, so that's something that can be can be challenging for people. I think. Wow, no one's ever quite put it that way, but um, I'm going to say I can relate to this. Whether I didn't realize it until just now, you really opened mm-hmm. up a, like a part of my mind that's there subconsciously that I didn't realize, mm-hmm. but. I am that person as well. That I can go to the grocery store. I can get lost in the grocery store. It's kind of crazy. Like I'll go in there just to get like milk and cereal or something. Next mm-hmm. thing you know, I'm like searching aisles and I have ideas and like, how could I produce this? How could I make this? How could I turn this concept into a restaurant? And I'm like, I'm down a thousand different rabbit holes. I'm, I'm inspired in a yeah. thousand different ways. And right. um, I think that's one of the beauties right. of being in food is it surrounds us also and we do it all the time. And when we travel, you know... Um, around the world if you're in food you tend to eat your way through cities you know the mm-hmm. why the museums might be important or the tourist attractions or whatever if you're in the food business you tend to just naturally eat your way through a city i don't know how to describe it but your the food is the main attraction even though it's subconsciously in some cases like oh i'm here to see the eiffel tower but let's get some real good french food okay and yeah. you know and <laughs> french wine and, and whatever else and so yeah champagne and blah 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 and macarons and blah 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 that you can never yeah. stop eating at anywhere I go like I everywhere I go I want to try new food and so you know I think that that's something that just naturally happens once you're in you're you're a foodie maybe but mainly when you're a food entrepreneur is that a lot of these creative ideas a lot of things that happen are are every day and there are times where you would think I'd get overwhelmed by all of it because I'm like, how am I ever going to execute? Like, I had 50 ideas today. I'm probably not even going to execute one of them. But what I found is, like, even if I write stuff down or I journal it just for the audience, like, those ideas sometimes come back and I use them, like, seriously, like, five years later. It's yeah. kind of crazy. When the, when the time is right. When, when the time, time is right. right. Yeah. yeah, I have I have so many ideas for food products and for dishes and for different themed events that I could do. It, it just feels endless. It really does, whether they're big ideas and um, big endeavor, large endeavors or just small little ideas for a, a new product I could sell to farmer's market. I'm, I'm, and sometimes I, I overextend, I have a tendency to overextend myself and take on too many different things and bite off a little bit more than I can <laughs> chew. Um, and I, I, I tap into all these different areas of the food business. You know, I want to do wholesale and I want to do dining experiences and special events and catering and farmer's markets and food deliveries and, and, 
and do music and food events and and just it's you know there's and keto keto italian and gluten-free italian and um italian entrees for kids italian entrees for family you know it's just i don't it's just like endless and um but you can only do so much and but but sometimes you, like you said you have an idea and you'll just put it aside on the back burner and and one day the, the timing is right and you know you pull out that idea and you you can finally do something about it but it's a good thing we aren't business partners because you and I would be stuck in like the clouds like for days. Like when you said all this stuff, like that's how my mind works. Like, oh, the keto, we you, we need Italian food that does that. Oh, and don't forget paleo. And oh, yeah, and gluten-free since everything in Italy, Italian mostly has gluten in it. So how do we, you know, bring that to everyone who has a gluten sensitivity or allergen? You know, I 100% have gone down that rabbit hole and like – probably on a daily basis across a lot of different cuisines. Um, And so I like that a lot and I agree with you. And I think that that's exactly when people talk about constructing roadmap and business plans, uh, you know, as entrepreneurs, and it's funny, I guess it's good practice to have a business plan, but if you don't have an act, it's, it should be like an actual growing plan. Tell people this all the time, especially when I consult or coach them, like never longer than 10 pages. If it's 10 pages, even like, I'm like, how, why do you need that long? But it should be always growing and changing and coming up with new ideas and evolving. And in order to do that, you have to do exactly what we're talking about uh, for the audience. What Gene is doing is constantly be in that creative space and constantly forcing your mind to grow and explore and come up with ideas that are planting seeds for the future. They're putting, for lack of a better term, they're filling the pipeline. Exactly. And so I I think that that's uh, pretty amazing. Um, what yeah, do you I think enjoy- it's, a, it's a balance of of coming up with new ideas constantly, and you can't stop yourself from from getting ideas. But um, it's a balance between doing that and also just having creating or formating for, forming or formulating a clear vision for yourself, so that you you don't you know you're kind of not um, aimless in what you're doing. So I think there's a balance between um, coming up with new ideas and and also executing a vision um so there's you know i I think there's and it can be a hard balance because there's constantly new things i want to do but that's something i i'm trying to work towards a little bit so i mean what do you enjoy the most about being in food like what do you what do you truly enjoy about this maybe even a musician also like what is the the things that Mm -hmm. you really enjoy like you know there's the motivation to do it but what are the things that are giving you reward what's rewarding you What's for what's rewarding me? I love kind of like the instant gratification I get when people eat my food and try it and, and love it. I love that part of it. Um, I like the the feel the feeling of gratification that comes with creating something new, um, coming up with a new dish, um, expanding, coming up with new products, marketing them. Um, the marketing aspect is very gratifying for me. I love being creative with that as well. Um, I love I love the little things. I love even um, building my email list. I've been <laughs> really excited about that and how much that is um, helping to um, expand my customer base, my email list. Um, so just the, the whole idea of expanding and growing and coming up with new ideas and reaching new people and and um, finding new opportunities is very gratifying. And, and, and that's, that's what I love about it. Um, And it's kind of, you know, that old cliche saying that it's, it's the journey, but I love, I do love that aspect of it. I love feeling the business grow and experiencing, um, experiencing that. And, um, and it's very gratifying and it brings me a lot of joy and it's, it keeps me going and it, it, fuels that obsession so what's the best day you've ever had in your in your food business oh the best day i've ever had in my food business wow hmm well i would say something that was pretty exhilarating but also exhausting was uh kind of in my you know i haven't been catering that long I, it was sort of something i fell into by accident but there was an event uh, about a year ago for 200 people that I catered all by myself <laughs> and I did uh I did all of the cooking <laughs> and all all of the food prep all of the cooking all of the delivery setup 
um, you know, I'm a one woman business, but I catered a 200 person event and it was plenty of food. <laughs> it was a little bit nerve wracking at first when I saw the people, all the people enter the room and uh, I started to worry that I wouldn't have enough food. It was kind of a buffet setup, but it turned out to be plenty and it was good. And it was, that was kind of, that was very exhilarating and very encouraging. Um, <laughs> let me see. Um, I've had a lot of little moments um, that I've enjoyed, um, but that was, um, that's that interesting. Was, I always worry like, about that too. That's my only worry. Yeah. We were talking about detaching from the outcome. For me, it's always, do we have enough food? I'd, and it's weird yeah. because you don't want to have too much because you don't want to lose money. But at the same time, I'm always like, mm-hmm. I don't want to run out. And I know everyone's like, oh, mm-hmm. you want scarcity and you want people to want it and, and have need for it and look like it's like, I'm like, no, that is not no. the way I can function. You also want people to feel like they're getting their money's worth. Yep, exactly. So I've had nightmares about running out of food. Um, but that, so that was exciting. Um, but this has been a really good summer for me. I've, I've, I have definitely felt the growth in my business this summer, this farmer's market season. I've been building my email list. I have, um, I have regular customers every week at my markets, um, getting new catering opportunities. I'm working on a few special events. I, I have another friend in town who's also comes from, uh, uh, an entrepreneurial family, Italian, an Italian food family. And we're working on creating uh, an Italian kind of an Italian festival in, in Nashville. Um, that's something that we want to do. I'm in, uh, I'm will so, support you guys, whatever I need to, if I need to drive okay. people there from the podcast or I need oh, to speak okay. there or whatever, I oh, will do it f- cool. whatever I will volunteer. You can have my time. Oh, awesome. My, my list of people I can push through my contact list in Nashville is pretty crazy because for some reason that's just where we number one where even with New York City and even with you know we have a footprint in over 133 countries now we just entered Iran and Syria interestingly which I'm not sure sure. so sure how I feel about that but we are there and uh and quite rapidly downloading there and gaining interest there for this podcast but Interesting, Nashville is still the hottest bed. Um, it's our third largest listening base, uh, interestingly, and it has the um, and we get the most entrepreneurs from there. Just because I think the mindset, the understanding that food is entertainment. That's also why I like Nashville, guys. That's also why I do and think that there's a lot of entrepreneurs there taking the risk because they understand that food is also showtime. Right? Yeah. It's it's it is. It is definitely a booming city and it's a growing city. And, you know, I, I sort of have um, I've been living here a decade, but I also have kind of a front seat um, view to, to everything that's going on in Nashville because my husband's on the city council in Nashville and he he works in local politics and he's been heavily involved and he's campaigning right now. And um, so we're we're we've kind of been bouncing around the city everywhere to different events and um, we, um, th- he's been heavily involved in a lot of the, the new developments in Nashville and, 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 and everything that's been going on over the past decade. So, um, I kind of have a front, 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 uh, front row <laughs> yeah. view to everything that's been going on. And it's, it's really, Nashville has exploded in so many ways. Um, it is even, it's a lot different even than when I moved here, uh, 10 years ago. So, um, I think um, um, it, I think even in terms of food, there's a, a lot a lot of new types of food that have come here over the past decade. Um, it's just become even more of a melting pot. Um, it's not I think back in the old days it used to be just meat and threes and steak houses and there wasn't even a lot of Italian food when I came here, but that that's definitely yeah. changed. New businesses all the time. And um, a lot of po- the pop-up business uh, market is is very, very big the food truck um scene is very popular um there's just a lot to a lot to eat here so (laughs) yeah and i was involved in like restaurant equipment and restaurants and building and designing restaurants for well over uh well over a decade and early on down there i went down there to do some projects when things were just starting to turn around and it's nothing like it is now not with the honky tonks not with the way it's booming definitely not the number of people and if you anyone went there when i was i was like a kid we used to go there for horse show sales because i grew up on a horse Mm -hmm. farm quarter horse farm and so we go there for horse uh sales and auctions and you know the banks down there and stuff 
And I think there was like gravel roads even downtown when I was a kid because I would like stuff like gravel into glass Coca Cola bottles because I was oh. I'm that old guy. So yes, soda used to come in glass when I was a kid, and that was when they had New Coke, which was the a great disaster in and of itself. Which well, I was about five years old, but I remember the disaster of New Coke. And so it's right around when I was in Nashville, interestingly. So it weirdly anchors the city for me. Um, but the progress in that city, it's a lot like Denver after the marijuana boom. Once Denver passed or Colorado passed marijuana, Denver boomed. Mm -hmm. And yes. for whatever reason, whenever the flood hit Nashville and flooded everything, um, it, it, there's a weird – I don't even know how to describe it. It's just a new – business mindset came around a new idea came to the forefront of you know some of the land was cheaper but they were able to attract the right people to the right place to start a boom and i don't know how to describe it but i would mm -hmm. i will say that in an instant the flood hits and and for me and i'm guessing because just based off of i'm intellectually guessing i'm using my intelligence of my research and stuff that once nashville sort of really accepted and got off the fact that it was just country music and i know it's always not been that way but weirdly i feel like it really was like okay we're going after it and then kid rock puts his his um honky tonk there which is kid rock is not necessarily country but i think with that weird transition where they became more encompassing uh mm -hmm. to all of music was their catalyst no different than like denver or colorado um i would say denver because we're comparing cities uh, to the marijuana, changing marijuana because of boom. I mean, I think Denver went from like one and a half million, two million people now to six million, almost eight million in the next decade or two. It'll get up to maybe mm -hmm. 10 um, decades, sorry, in a year or two. I don't know why I keep saying decade. In the next year or two, um, because of the population, the amount of people moving from Col California and, and New York, both to Nashville and to Colorado. Interestingly, those are two very huge um, areas for people to move from. And even Nashville now, you don't have to be in food or in music to be moving there. People are just moving there, whether it's insurance, yeah. whether it's the trains, whether it's construction, whether it's restaurant equipment, you know, whether it's selling blinds. You know, there is a lot of people that are moving to Nashville because they want that, that southern way of life, that slower pace of life, although Nashville is not that. You will not get it there. Um, at least in my opinion, you may need to go a little farther out, but even that Nashville is sort of, um, uh, I don't know, a Northern, Eastern, Western city in the South. It's, it's why it's almost like California meets New York city. You have New York city being Nashville major being Manhattan. You can only go up and then you have like Brentwood and the suburbs being more like the different parts of Los Angeles from Hollywood all the way to Crenshaw. So, mm -hmm. uh, no, you're absolutely right. When I when I go to Memphis and I spend time in Memphis, I feel like I'm in the South. I feel like I'm in a Southern city. It's a little bit sleepier. It feels a little bit s slower paced. Nashville, you're right, is not that way. It, it it really feels in many ways like a Northern city. And I I can't I can't say how it used to be because I've only been here ten years. Um, I'm maybe in 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 decades past. It was a little bit of a slower paced city. But now it is definitely not that way. Um, I, I think compared to a lot of northern cities, it's still a much more affordable place to live. That's why people from California and Chicago and New York are moving here. And then, uh, and, and then it, it grows and, and, and prices have gone, gone up dramatically. Um, but I, it, it definitely doesn't feel like that, that slow-paced southern city. Um, but, it, but it's still a, a really, really um, feels like a... a, a healthy quality of life and and um it's it has a lot to offer and it's there's a lot to do and there's a lot to see and it's an exciting place to be right now yeah and i will say this and i like i said i've spent the last oh i've spent some time in georgia also like two years mm -hmm. but also still being in colorado for about nine years mm -hmm. um but you know it is it is a faster pace of life than Colorado, for sure. I enjoy that. I grew up on the East Coast, so I like that like very fast-paced way of life. I like executing. I like small conversation. I like quick meetings. You know, it, it's just the way it is. And I find that in Nashville as well. People are always hustling. 
um, I was so busy there and adjusting from being in Nashville and the life and growing the different podcasts and the different shows, uh, doing mm-hmm. consulting work there and various other things that I was doing, that it was it was like my life was passing by very fast because it I hadn't been in that fast pace of life in almost nine years. Even though I'm an entrepreneur and life is very fast paced, it's not like once you get around fast paced people who are hustling. Another thing about Nashville is because it's smaller, not quite like New York City or not quite like Los, Los Angeles, you have a high concentration of entrepreneurial mindset, I would say, in a growing environment, whether it's the musicians, as we discussed earlier, or the food entrepreneurs or people who are now building businesses based on the musicians or based on the food entrepreneurs are now entrepreneurs based finding solutions for other entrepreneurs um Mm -hmm. it moves very quickly and it's very cool to see the ingenuity and growth and almost self-incubating okay it's the weirdest thing it's like there doesn't need to be a lot of push there there doesn't need to be a lot of you have an idea, go for it there. No, everyone's already gone through that by the time they got to Nashville. They're already over the hump that you just need to go for it. Even if it wasn't the, even if I'm in food now and I originally went and staked it all in music, that weird fear of not, of not leaping, that weird fear of, you know, holding myself back or not trusting my instinct doesn't exist the same way in Nashville, which is also why I think everything's moving so quickly is because of this confidence that happens there from the entrepreneurial mindset. So, um, very cool, Gina. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a really great way of, of, of summarizing it. Yeah. I, I think you, I think you're onto something. Sorry, I took over the no. commentary there for a second. <laughs> Sorry no, about that. No, no, I have a great. tendency that's, to do something. It's great some... to hear your perspective on Nashville. Um, no, I love Nashville. Um, you know, I don't know what what's in store if I will uh, end up being back there again permanently. But, you know, I am always open to cities like Nashville for sure. I think that between New York and Denver and Los Angeles and Nashville, those are pretty four places that are pretty ideal for me. Maybe even Miami, depending how life goes. But I have a little more flexibility in my life now than than most people. So I get to choose, mm-hmm. honestly. So that was the whole point of being an entrepreneur. I get to choose yeah. my life for the most part. And yeah. uh, okay, Absolutely. my last question for you. Well, maybe my second to last question, actually. If you could go back and tell yourself anything two years ago when you started this in, in the middle of you know COVID and doing what you're doing, what would what advice would you give yourself? When I, for when I started my food business, yeah, absolutely. That don't you know try now. To take, yes, don't try to take on too much too quickly. D- try to build slowly, um, have patience, and it is quality over quantity. And I would tell my, my, my younger musician self the same thing. Patience, build slowly, quality over quantity. For sure. That would be my advice. How do you define success, Gina? I'm, I lied. I said two questions. I actually have three <laughs> now because the, you okay. just asked that what you just said. Is, how do you define success? How do you define that you're doing well? How, I, in the food business, I define success by... Um, Making money, <laughs> making money, making a living, uh, being able to save money, um, not losing money. That's for sure. I'm very proud that um, since day one, I've never operated in the red in my, with my food business. I've been really, really good, surprisingly, <laughs> as a mus- being a musician um, with, with budgeting and, and figuring out my costs and, and, and how much I want to net and, and, and achieving that. So um, that, that is definitely success to me um um new customers um repeat repeat customers uh, repeat orders um people who buy your food and then they come back for more that's success to me expanding um little things like building my email list and and introducing new products and and just expanding my business and and growing it that's being successful to me um I, and I guess as cliche as it sounds, that as I, I have the freedom that I want to have in my life and I'm doing exactly what I want to do. And I, I answer only to myself <laughs> and I, I am pretty fearless when it comes to my endeavors. Um, and that's, 
that makes me feel successful. I don't, if I want to do something, I don't hesitate out of fear. Um, so if, but if, if I was that way, I probably wouldn't feel successful. So um, not hesitating and, and going after what, what I want certainly makes me feel successful and, and makes me feel like I um, am pursuing my potential. And so all of those things combined, I would say. And, and gosh, Gina, I really appreciate you coming on the show. And this will be my last question for you. Like, where do you want this to go in the next 5, 10, 15, 25 years? I know you talked about you're putting stuff into consumer packaged goods um, mm-hmm. for the audience, yeah. which CPG is a term, but it's your uh, seasonings are going into packages. I noticed online you have jars, but you also have moved into the plastic bottles and things like that. So you're growing that as well. So, I think just on that and and what you're doing, like, where do you want this to go? I mean, are you hoping for a brick and mortar one day? Are you hoping for a food truck? Like sort of help me understand what's what's going on in in that brain of yours. I would say no and no, no brick and mortar, no food truck. So I think, I mean, I, as as far as a restaurant goes, I, I, there are people who are enormously successful with doing it, but for me to an extent, it defeats the purpose of, being an entrepreneur as I define it, uh, as I define what, what an entrepreneur is, which is just having the ultimate freedom and flexibility in your life and working only when you want to work and creating your own schedule. And I feel you lose that a little bit or a lot when you have a restaurant, a brick and mortar. And I, I don't want that as tempting as it would be to have a little space where I serve my food to people. Um, I just, you know, never say never. Uh, but it, it's not one of my goals. I, it's not something I envision for myself. And and neither is a food truck. So what the direction that I probably would like to go in, in the next, and, and something that I am working on is um, going more the wholesale route. And I would love to turn this into more passive income in the next five to 10 years through my wholesale products and specifically developing um, frozen entrees. And I would love to be in every supermarket nationwide. And I would love to, I would love for me and my husband in five years to go to Italy and sit on the beach and I'll be sitting there on my laptop. That's how I envision it. In five years, I'm sitting on the beach in Italy with my laptop, running my wholesale business in Amer- from Italy. And and my food is in every supermarket in the country. That's what I, that's what I envision. <laughs> um, we should talk. That's my, like one of my main expertise is turning people's food into either frozen or fresh meals uh, for grocery stores or direct to consumers. That was one of the things okay. I scale for a living. That's <laughs> one of my main professions, but we can, um, okay. I Absolutely. can either hook you up with people or introduce you to different manufacturers or people that can help you with that or whatever. Cause I can help expedite that. Interestingly, uh, you're talking to the right person. I don't want anything for it. Obviously um, I'm out of that life. I don't want to get in the middle of anything. I just want to connect people uh, right now. Well, that would be great. So let's let's definitely talk, and I'll tell you more about my idea. Yeah. And uh, you can you can um, give me your perspective. Yes, I do I have love a very this. specific idea. So. Yes, I love this. I hope it has to do with gluten free also at some point because if you're on that scale, where we're you know good things are coming. So. Um, but also I think the regular at home Italian food and, and meals is something that's greatly lacking in the world right now. So, uh, yes, I would love to talk and for anyone in the audience, uh, thank you guys for listening in. Um, I appreciate you guys and, uh, where can we find you, Gina online, your music, you, your business, wherever you can find me on social media and the best place to follow my food business, uh, is on uh, bo- both on Instagram and on Facebook. So it's Gina's Italian Cuisine on Instagram. And it's the same thing on Facebook. I have a page, Gina's Italian Cuisine, and also a group that you can join where I often post my food products and pictures and, and adventures. And as far as music, you can find me on Instagram at Gina Cecilia Music and also GinaCecilia.com or just Google me and, and a bunch of things will come up. About twenty years worth of things will come up. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Yeah, I'm the, yeah. It's and the skeletons in the closet come up. That's always fun. All the, right? <laughs> All the, way, the Wikipedia. Yeah, yeah there so. you go. Yeah. Uh, I just joke around, but seriously, as an entrepreneur, we just um, we just have a really good thing um, that we do when we're entrepreneurs and connecting people and introducing people, even if it doesn't benefit us. So I do want to help you out, and I there's a lot of entrepreneurs out there. I believe. 
that you know the altruistic entrepreneur is always looking to grow themselves by growing others. So mm-hmm. I'd love to help yeah. you out. I believe in your brand. I'm definitely going to ask you to do a part two eventually as uh, after we finish the other conversation so we can sort of go down rabbit holes on some other things and other questions I have around your businesses. But we, we're about out of time here. So, But I appreciate your time, Gina. Uh, it's weirdly... You're weirdly refreshing and you bring a sense of calmness that I've not felt before in a lot of the guests or in a lot of people, Um, even as an Italian, because we tend to be like very hyped up and passionate, but you seem to have a sense of balance and calmness while doing it, which I think is probably one of your superpowers and probably why you're doing so well. Um, you know, I don't freak out. I, I think I'm, I'm, I try to stay calm, cool and collected. So maybe that's part of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's exactly it. It is very, oh. um, it's a very great quality in leadership and in entrepreneurism. And obviously as a musician, I've got to imagine that comes in pretty handy, but, um, mm-hmm. I just wanted to compliment you obviously. And number two, that was number one. Number two is I think what you're doing is incredible. And I think Nashville is the right place to do it. And I also think that keeping yourself free, because I'm someone who used to have brick and mortars all over the country, anywhere from 7,500 square foot kitchen to 123,000 square foot kitchen um, to produce food, is that those things can become anchors. And if you end up accidentally, I say accidentally because entrepreneurs, we do this, working too much in your businesses and not on your businesses, years will go by where you have not grown your businesses properly. And Mm -hmm. I, so that's when you have such a healthy boundary over it and understand it. I totally understand where you're coming from now, where I am in my life and not sure I ever want brick and mortars again in my life, you know? And so that type of thing, or if I'm actually going to produce food itself, considering I did it for 24 years, you know, and now I'm out of it. And Mm -hmm. I'm like, do I want that everyday stress? Do I want that everyday thing? And while I want to benefit Mm -hmm. the world and grow the world, there's a lot of different ways of doing it through food than actually just producing it. Um, So I understand what you're saying. And I also understand the benefit of doing co-packing that you're talking about and getting it to the mass audiences in that way and uh, being able to, to do things differently. Um, So very Mm -hmm. cool. Um, is there anything you want to share with the audience before we go? Oh, is there anything I want to share? I think I've said it all, but <laughs> thanks to everyone who's listened. And and this was really, uh, really cathartic for me in a lot of ways, too. It's it's great to to talk about my 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 endeavors and in, in this food journey with with like minded individuals. And and it can feel since I am a one woman business and I'm doing this alone, it can feel a little bit isolating sometimes. And um, but it's it's great to discuss it with 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 people who understand and who have the same passion. So I really appreciate it. And uh, thanks to everyone who listened. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll send you an invite for the Gorilla Brave group on Facebook. So there's a lot of entrepreneurs, food entrepreneurs in there that have gathered that have just been on the podcast. There's some outsiders in there as well, but they're all food entrepreneurs um, that have similar mind space uh, mindset that we're talking about here. Uh, And it's a safe place for everyone to hang out. Something we launched uh, back in January and really have been getting off the ground recently is to try to give you guys that support system because as I've done these interviews and I talk to a lot of you guys offline or I've done coaching offline or consulting offline for businesses and restaurants and food companies, I often find that a lot of the solutions are just in each other. It's not in mm. paying someone. It's not in hiring someone. It's, it's the the money or the time's better spent in a group uh, where the group's being coached as a collective with the same mm-hmm. fundamentals or benefiting from each other under the same fundamentals. And then they can go off of those fundamentals and get into the deeper conversation versus trying to cover fundamentals over a bunch of individuals when you can cover it as a whole. Uh, that's just my experience. Uh, and I mm. sort of am laying it out for the audience there. Gorilla Brave is that thing for food entrepreneurs. If you're on the show, you automatically get into that group online on the Facebook group. You don't have to go through any of the other mess because I've obviously already interviewed you and talked to you and done all the process. So it doesn't, you know, you're you're in and I'll give you that. And obviously for being on the show, you don't have to worry about paying for anything. It's my gift. So That'd I appreciate it. Um, 
I appreciate you doing that. I appreciate it, Gina. And I hope that that also helps you find some like-minded individuals. And there are some manufacturers in there that do some co-packing as well and and ship all across the country uh, and are going across the world now. So you might meet some individuals in there as well. Um, Same with the audience. You know, look up Gorilla Brave if you're in the the food space. It is a place to to help grow those networks, to do social events and stuff like that. Um, and I will also reach out to you, Gina. We are doing a networking event for Gorilla Brave um, in the next two weeks. Uh, it's supposed to be next Tuesday. I'm waiting on confirmation because I had to move it from this week because I was traveling last minute. And uh, but we are probably going to do a networking event at Pins Mechanical in Nashville on Tuesday from 2 p.m. to 7 p.m. on the 26th of November or 27th of no I'm November geez 27th of June wow I'm already in November um but okay yeah let's not get to November yet bizarre let's enjoy the summer but um uh yeah so I'll let you know about that as well And the audience, you guys all heard it. It's a free event. It's open to the public. If you're in the food space, it is buy your own drinks and buy your own food. Um, But it is that we are gathering there as a free event to start getting people together, meeting a lot of the food entrepreneurs that have been on the show or not on the show that I've worked with or been there to all sort of get together and face-to-face network a little bit so they can be more familiar when they're in Gorilla Brave in the group on Facebook or, or at other events or the online coaching stuff we do. So, um, wonderful. there you go. And now the audience has it also. So thank you guys for listening in. I appreciate everyone. I love you guys very much. I appreciate the growth in the podcast. Um, you know, and I'll, and I'll leave it with this and sorry, Gene, I was going to quick hear this is that I had no idea what I was doing five years ago when we started this podcast, when Deborah and I started out of my, our garage, which was actually a CrossFit gym for a car garage because of our kids. Um, and are my stepkids, her kids. And um, I had no idea what it was going to be and what it was going to grow into. And even when when Gina talked about having an identity crisis, I a little bit backed off the podcast because I'm like, what am I doing here? This is successful, but I'm a food entrepreneur. I'm not a, a podcaster. Like, I don't want to, like, I don't know what I was doing, like, in this space. And weirdly, I took a little break, but I eventually ended up back here. You know, I ended up back to because there's that obsession. There's that thing that I can do well at this. I like doing it. Let me do better at this. I can help the world with this. I can spread other people's stories so it can help not only them, but the people who hear their story. So, you know, I think that there's a lot there. And as an entrepreneur, uh, anyone who's out there as an entrepreneur, you don't need to be stuck in one place. You know, I know it's cliche that everyone's like, oh, do one thing right and then move on to the next thing. I get that in essence, but I also as an entrepreneur get that opportunity comes from building businesses or through hardship. And sometimes you've got to be in different industries, in different tasks as an entrepreneur, no different than Gina is. So that's what I'm going to lay everyone with, leave everyone with and lay it on everyone is that it's okay to diversify as an entrepreneur. It's okay. They require the same skills in a lot of ways. And I know being a chef isn't the same as producing music, but the oversight of business, the oversight, and Gina has both skills. So why not be an entrepreneur in both? has interest in both, has a passion in both, has a drive in both. So don't ignore your other interests and don't get so involved in working in your businesses that you don't work on them or don't work on other business ideas or other entrepreneurial endeavors. So thank you everyone for listening in. Again, you can find us on Spotify or wherever else you grow yourself through podcasts. I'm Justin Bizarro. That's B-I-Z-Z-A-R-R-O. And you can find me on Instagram or you can find this show on Instagram at Justin the Food Entrepreneur's. Thank you guys, and we're out.